Well, hey there. Hello. Welcome back to the train cycle uh, trainer uh, talks that we do here. And my name is uh, Santa Claus or or Zeus or whatever you want to call me with my big beard. as uh, Or as my cousin Gary, who has been on these trainer talks before, would call me. I look more like Krampus than Santa Claus. But we'll go with whatever. How are you doing, Liz? I'm doing great. Real excited to be here again. And I, I wish I, I could see what all you're hiding in that beard there. <laughs> I, I'll never tell because <laughs> uh, I, I get away with a lot. <laughs> so I believe the theme for this uh, trainer talk is stage management, correct? It is. I'm real excited about this one. And we have uh, four people we're going to talk to or at least listen to. Um, we have uh, full disclosure. One of our uh, guests is actually doing what it is we're talking about tonight. So uh, he couldn't be here. We'll talk about him in just a second. So um, we'll, we do have all four of them, at least in spirit here. And we will uh, listen to uh, three of them live and one of them recorded. And um, why don't we just kick right into it? Let's do it. Let's jump, let's jump right in. So first we have the one who is not with us today. Uh, Eric Lee Tysinger has spent the last 19 years stage managing and producing uh, or production managing in all facets of the performing arts. He has, I don't know of many things that is either on Broadway or off Broadway that he's not at least had his hand in before because you look at his resume and I, it, it's like war and peace. So, um, you know what? Let's just hear from him. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Tysinger. Hi guys, how are you? Um, what a treat to be um, sort of here with you this evening. Um, my name is Eric Tysinger. I'm a stage manager, uh, production manager, technician. Uh, I, I dabble in all three. Um, uh, currently in uh, Texas, uh, and if you've followed any part of the news, uh, it's a disaster here right now. Uh, they could use a few trainers uh, from this group uh, on the Texas power grid. So it's, it's, a, it's a mess here. Um, I got into stage management uh, very early um, in college. Um, I have had 19 years in the business. Uh, I've been all over um, regional theater, commercial theater, um, theme park entertainment, uh, corporate uh, entertainment, dance, opera. Uh, I have really been fortunate to be able to work in, in all of the areas. You know, stage management for me uh, is a passion because I um, – very much enjoy being a central communicator. I enjoy uh, keeping the train on the tracks, truly. I enjoy being the conductor. Um, and uh, have, I found that very early. Uh, I was doing a, a show at UNC Greensboro, and um, we were actually running the lights off of uh, a, a panel, a, an electrical panel. So it was like, okay, switches one, three, five, seven, and nine are gonna come on at this point and we're gonna kill 13 and 15 kind of thing. And uh, in the ability, in the problem solving of that particular one person comedy show in a small uh, ballroom at UNCG, um, the sort of skill set all came together and I realized that this is actually the part of live entertainment that I wanted to do. Um, and I haven't stopped since, uh, truly. I've been very blessed to, to keep working for now about 19 years. Awesome. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, Brianna Valdere has uh, been uh, has nine years of experience across regional, nonprofit, and for profit, and theme park theater. She's worked in theater management um, as well as theater education, and she has done some high school technical theater internships at her last two resident companies. So let's bring in Brianna Valdere. Hey, thanks for having me. So tell so, us a little bit about yourself. So we, around, you take two minutes, just talk. Talk about you. Talk about Brianna, what, what Brianna's about. Well, in terms of my theater career, I got started pretty almost as soon as I graduated high school. Uh, my One of my old high school drama teachers actually hooked me up with a stage management job at a little, you know, hole-in-the-wall equity showcase gig in New York. Um, so I, I did I did some of those for a few years. Then I went to school for stage management. Um, 
right after graduating college, that's when I started uh, getting work in theme parks. Uh, and then after that, that was when I moved into regional theater uh, on that track, eventually got my equity card. Um, and then in between, in between all of those jobs, I've, um, there's, there's been some like miscellaneous work, like the theater management or like one-off shows and casinos that I've done. Um, I did actually exit theater in March, 2019, and now I work in animal care, but I still, uh, but I still keep in close contact with, um, with my coworkers from that world. Awesome. Well, thank you. And welcome to our trainer talk. Ms. Karen Perlato has been a professional stage manager for over 20 years and has uh, and is a member of Aquas, Actors Equity. I can't talk. I've only had three sips of this beer, <laughs> this one. I've had a whole full other one, but this is the only one. I've only had three of this one. <laughs> uh, she has over 20 years in, in uh, experience and a member of Actors Equity since 2003. She's always been based in New York, but her career has taken her regional to stock theaters, tours, and events all over the United States. Let's bring in Karen Perlato. Hello. Thanks for having Hi. me. It's great to be here. Welcome, welcome. So tell us a little bit about KP. All right. That was half of what I was going to say was in that in that summary. That was great. Um, yeah. So uh, I have uh, I started out my career in New York. I've always been based in New York, as I think I said. Um, but I started out my career, same as Brianna, doing the like off off Broadway equity showcase route. Um, I have gone through a few phases of my career where I've done some off Broadway for a while, staying in the city. Um, most of what I have done, I would say, is regional and stock. I kind of uh, think of myself as, as if anything, a specialist in large stock musicals, like the skill of putting on a large musical in, you know, two weeks of rehearsal and two days of tech is kind of a, a thing that you need to ha kind of have special practice at. And so if anything, I would love, to, you know, I'd love to say my specialty is I'm a, a Broadway PSM, but I'm not. So <laughs> the thing that I've kind of landed on is, uh, is, is summer stock and, and regional theater um, big musicals. And um, most of the time, I'd say 90% of the time as production stage manager, although I do love ASMing, but I, I don't get asked to do it a lot. I think probably because people think maybe I don't want to, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I love PSMing and I think, uh, similar to what Eric said in his video, um, the act of the problem solving and being being the person, I think he said the conductor driving the train or whatever, um, that uh, that appeals to me as well. And I think if, if you don't hate it, because a lot of people hate it and I can see why, I think if you don't hate it, you have an obligation to do it if you enjoy it. Um, and so I, I've had a great time for my whole career and I hope to get back to it very soon. Excellent. Wow. So you've been doing that for 20, 20 years. And 22 years. You, Actually, I did the math while I was preparing for this. this statement. Okay. <laughs> so you started I when you were what, three, four? No, I'm 41. I'm, oh, come on. I'm going to be 42. There's no way. No way. I was like, yeah, I, I thought the same thing. Well, thank I was you. Like, I'm really glad. <laughs> <laughs> so Molly Miller's management career includes a wide variety of productions from intimate two-person dramas to large-scale spectacles with, on occasion, more than 150 artists on stage, not to mention those working behind the scenes. Ladies and gentlemen, Molly Miller. Molly. Hi, guys. Oh, Molly. Oh, the other ones didn't get this. I... Oh, oh, I meant to add that. We're up in the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's for all of you. I'm sorry. I, for, I forgot to do it the first two times. Three times. So tell us about Molly. Um, so I started my theater career as a theater brat. Um, I think I did my first show when I was like six or seven. Um, you know, as one of those little kids that was in Wizard of Oz, a show I have now done many, many times. Um, <laughs> and I moved to my technical career uh, somewhere in high school when a very smart theater teacher said to me, you know, you're great on stage. You have a skill set that would be really awesome backstage, and I want you to try stage managing a show. And I got bit by the bug, and I never looked back. Um, I was very privileged to go to a amazing um, arts magnet high school that has a phenomenal theater um, that Liz could probably tell you a little something about. Um, and had the opportunity to, as soon as I turned 18, started working those overhire calls with IOTC and 
went to school from there and I've been in the industry for about 18 years now. And that was pretty much history. Very cool. Awesome. So we want to remind the viewers who are watching this that you can ask questions by typing it in the chat here. Um, yes, questions for our stage managers, let us know in the comments and we will address them as soon as we possibly can. So what that means is if we're playing a video from Eric, then of course we will not stop the video to answer a question. However, once that video is finished, we will answer the question afterwards. So first question I do have, um, let's start with Brianna. What would you define a stage manager as? What is the definition of a stage manager? I think the easy way to define, I think probably the most straightforward way to define a stage manager is in relation to the director. So a director sets the artistic vision of a show in rehearsals, and a stage manager maintains the artistic integrity of a show in performance. This means that you are responsible for knowing everything about everything uh, about what goes on on stage and off stage. Who comes on when? What are they saying? Where do they go? What are they wearing? What are they carrying? Etc. You're also doing all the behind the scenes communication to make all these things possible so that the only thing that the director has to focus on and all the designers have to focus on is the art and you your part of part of your job is allowing everyone to do their jobs to the best of their ability. So what I'm hearing is basically you you take the vision that the director has and you make sure the parts are are working while they make sure that it is coming to fruition. I think that's a good summary, yes. Excellent. <laughs> Molly, what would you say a, a stage manager is? So I would define a stage manager as that core communicator. So our job is to make sure everybody is where they need to be, when they need to be there, doing what they need to be doing the way they need to be doing it. <laughs> um, and that extends not just to your actors on stage, it also extends to all of your crew backstage, um, right down to your group that is managing your front of house and everything around it. Um, so to me, your stage managers are your ultimate organizers. Um, we are the conductors Besides the actual conductors, because of course, if you're doing a musical or something, you have an actual conductor. So I guess I shouldn't use that that term for us. Um, but we're kind of driving the ship once the director has filled out the bones and made it pretty. <laughs> okay. KP, you have anything different on between those two? I think they pretty much both split it. When I'm asked this question, I, the answer I generally try to start with is that it, you're like the very central hub of all the spokes of the different pieces of the production. And it's just, it's about organ making sure that the, you know, the information over here gets to the person over there and like everybody has what they need and that everyone is doing the piece that they need to do to make the show happen. Um, very quickly, I will give you my my sort of infamous summary of stage management. It's like the sport of curling, which I don't actually know anything about, but you know, it's like where they there's somebody, they're on ice, you throw a rock and like, so, okay, so the rock is the show and the people who push the rock are like the creative team and the actors and stuff. And they've got, you know, a target they're trying to hit across the ice and they push the rock and we're the people with the brooms sweeping the ice in front of the rock to get it to land where they wanted it. And, you know, we're not really supposed to touch the rock. It's like, you just, you just clear the path and you remove the obstacles and the show arrives where it's supposed to be. I like that. That makes sense. too. <laughs> so you're like, you're like the router. The, yeah. the, the director is the modem and you're the router. <laughs> you distribute from, from the main idea. That's a good way to put it. So what we're going to do when we have stuff for Eric is we're going to, um, Liz will ask the question in the video. So when we do that, we will follow up with uh, the other panelists as to what their answers are. So um, I think we're going to play the first one now. 
Liz, um, uh, real, real right. quick, let's actually, we're, we've got a couple coming in from the audience. Can we grab one of these first? Will sure. That? Yeah. So Sean asks, what is your favorite show or performance? <sighs> KP, you want us to take that one first? Okay. Um, mine is uh, the Phantom of the Opera was the show that I saw when I was 12 that made me want to go into theater. And uh, I saw it on Broadway and that was it's still to this day my only Broadway credit, but um, it it was really special to me to be to end up stage managing the very show, the same production of the show with the same people still in it from from when I was twelve, and that made me want to be a stage manager. And um, so it's always a very special experience to me when when I get to call the show, especially um, it's it's something that's been part of my life the entire time that I've been interested in theater, and I think it's. It's a dream as a stage manager to call it because you are part of the storytelling. That it's I, the way I look at it is that it's the Phantom controls everyone in the show through magic, and that it is the staging is is designed in such a way where the stage manager is the instrument of making that magic, of making things appear and move with the music and and flow with you know a turn of his hand or something. And I I like to think of it as you have to convince the audience that what they're watching it's more likely to be magic than to be a bunch of stage hands and people pulling ropes and doing things and pushing buttons backstage. And I think it, it presents a really exciting challenge as a stage manager. And obviously it's incredibly personal to me because of my history with it. It's one of my favorite shows. Yeah. Yeah. So Brianna, what, what are your, how about you? What's your favorite show or performance? Uh, if, if there's so many ways to answer this question, is it like my favorite play that I've read or seen or worked on? Um, for scene, I'll say Twelfth Night. I, I have never seen a production of Twelfth Night that I have not loved, um, though I've never worked on it. Uh, the, the most fun I ever had working on a show was a production of The Wiz, which had a very large cast, um, very many of whom had never worked in theater before. They, uh, they, I think, just you know, knew the music of The Wiz from the movie. So for this new group of people to come together and to experience the magic and the camaraderie of theater for the first time, you know, to watch them growing to love what I love was really nice. Excellent. Molly, your turn. So this question is kind of like asking somebody who their favorite child is. Um, <laughs> But for me, a show that holds a very special place in my heart is actually Mary Poppins. It is a show I've done more than once. Um, I love the actual stage production because I feel like it makes those characters a lot more complex than anybody really realizes. There is a lot more to Mary than Disney really portrayed. Um, and the both times I've done that production, I have worked with two phenomenal Bert who really made the show just wonderful. Um, and you just can't beat doing a production where, you know, you get to build something and work with actors that are flying and tapping on ceilings and, you know, doing all those wonderful things. So for me, it's a show that's a challenge and I really enjoy that. Excellent. Good choice. Do we have any further questions from the audience? No, I say let's go to Eric now. Let's go to Eric now. And Alex, our director. So Eric, what were you me. in the middle of Sorry. when this pandemic hit us? Boy, uh, great question. Um, I had just finished uh, 15 months uh, on the national tour of Hamilton. Uh, I was in the Angelica Company. Um, uh, I have a family, I have a, a wife and daughter um, who, you know, very supportive, but I, I had missed the previous year's Christmas and Thanksgiving. And so the plan all along going into um, uh, the winter of the pandemic um, was for me to take a leave of absence to be home for the holidays. And then I was going to return um, in some capacity, whether that was full-time subbing uh, in a new role, um, you know, all of that was in discussion, but basically when I just saw the pandemic coming uh, or there was enough talk of it and I had an opportunity um, to work 
um, at the end of the holidays, I decided to just take a break. Um, I was still very much in the Hamilton family. In fact, I had some sub dates already uh, coming my way uh, for the future and, and we'll stay connected to them um, uh, when they return. So, uh, but, but I uh, was literally just missed like being on, in a bad situation for, uh, I just missed it by a couple of months. Um, and thankfully I was able to help um, run a performing arts center here in Fort Worth at a, a private school and that has continued into this pandemic. They have, um, in fact, in some ways, the need for a technical person has become much greater at the school level. Uh, so I've probably been a little more busy than in some of our folks in entertainment. Rihanna, what were you in the middle of when the pandemic hit? Uh, I had actually exited theater by that point, working at my animal shelter. Okay, KP. I was um, about 36 hours from going out to the Miss Saigon National Tour. Um, I had been waiting to book a major national tour for 20 something years, and I finally did. And my start date was March 16th, and the tour shut down on March 15th and was on March 20th permanently canceled. And uh, so I had like my suitcase was sitting on the table, like fully packed except for like the few things that were gonna go in on the morning of my departure. And it was just, we were, we were gonna be playing the Fox in Atlanta and it was like hitting refresh on the Fox website, you know, every 10 minutes. And there's like a little message that's like, we are still considering whether we will be doing next week's performance of Miss Saigon. And I was, uh, you know, like our second city after I joined had already been canceled. And so it was like, you know, I was gonna go out and then come home and then go out and it was like my training weeks. And it was, it was already a bad situation, but it was basically just what, waiting for the clock to run out and knowing what was gonna happen, but having to like, wait until the last minute to be like, am I getting on the plane? Am I not getting on the plane? And uh, so I don't know. I don't know if that ever, opportunity will ever come up again, but I was, I was proud of myself for having gotten the job. But sure. um, I, you know, I never, I, it was a bunch of people I, I didn't really know. I was getting to work for, for networks who I never worked for. So it was, it was a chance to make a lot of connections that I never got to meet any of those people. But, um, but I hope, you know, when things pick up, maybe someday. Well, I hate that you missed that. Yeah. Um, Molly, what were you in the middle of? Well, at the moment, I'm in the middle of having a heartache for KP because that's just heartbreaking. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I really hope that opportunity comes back for you. Um, I was right in the middle of a production of Guys and Dolls. Um, we had gotten all the way through all of our music production. We were just about to do our first uh, run like basic stumble through and nope. Sorry guys, here comes a giant national pandemic. Um, we can't, you can't have more than X amount of people in one room. Yada, yada, yada. You guys all know the, the things. So unfortunately that production was canceled. We, well, actually that production was pushed back a few times in an attempt of everyone hoping that this would go away a little sooner than it has. Um, and at this point it's kind of been tabled for the foreseeable future. And honestly, uh, I'm a little worried about that theater I was working with at this point. So. Well, hopefully it all works out for everybody. I, you know, I, we're going to ask, uh, I'll go ahead and ask the question now. How has COVID potentially altered theater for the better? And Molly, since you were already in the middle of that thought, let's start with you. So potentially what, what has COVID done to make theater better? Yeah, so I think we are tendency, we're having a tendency right now to really harp on all the negative that it's done to our industry and completely understandable. I mean, let's talk about the number of people out of work. Actually, let's not. But, you know, we think about that. Um, but what has it done for the better? Well, I think it's really done a couple of things. One, it's made us extremely more innovative. I have loved to see um, things like I live here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and we have the local School of the Arts and getting to watch what they're doing to allow their students to still learn and put on productions has been amazing. They filmed and they filmed the Nutcracker this year, essentially one person at a time, and then edited it all together. That's crazy. That's not anything we would have ever thought of doing before in our industry. And the leaps and bounds that we've come with things like that is 
just amazing. And I think it's taken us some time to step back and examine, okay, are there ways that we can do things, not the traditional way, that may be safer, um, more humane for our group as a whole and for our industry? All right. Rihanna, what do you think? How has uh, COVID uh, potentially altered the theater for the better? What I am hopeful for um, is that, that I have seen a lot of conversation um, around some of the unfair practices of, of theater for, for one thing, scheduling. There's a lot of talk around eliminating 10 out of 12 rehearsal days, um, which essentially for stage managers usually ended up turning into like 16 plus hour work days and not for us only but for a lot of other people in uh, in the industry as well um elim eliminating those potentially reducing uh, the rehearsal week from six days a week to five days uh, a week and so other sorts of um scheduling changes for one that i, I am hopeful will lead to a more person-centered uh, approach of making theater and recognizing that the people you are working with um, uh, need to be healthy outside of the theater world as well. Um, we need to have time for families. So I'm hope I'm full I'm hopeful that that comes out of it. I'm I'm hopeful that we can um, that we can think to restructure uh, rehearsal rehearsal and performance processes that better support the humans. Awesome. KP. Um, Brianna covered some of what I was going to say um, in that I, I think that what I've seen in general is this, this pause has given everyone a lot of time to talk about all the things that we don't like about the industry and the way that things have been done perhaps badly in the past. Um, not just in terms of the actual industry practices, but you know, we've spent so much time in the last year focusing on like social justice issues and and continuing the conversations about the Me Too movement. And and I think the, the fear of like, you always have a job and you're afraid to open your mouth because you have a job and you don't wanna, you know, say something that's gonna upset your employer or a future employer, potential employer. And the fact that none of us have any career prospects at the moment, I think has made people more willing to just be like, you know what, this is a problem. I felt that I was, you know, you know, a producer was racist to me, or I felt that I was harassed by this person, or, you know, just talking about the things we've experienced that were not right in the past and, and being braver maybe to approach them in the future and to, to, to call things out when we see them. Um, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen. We may be also desperate for work that we go back and it, you know, it's the same or it's worse, but I also think it's possible that we all might just be like, you know what, screw it. Like, I'm gonna say something about this because I sat at home doing nothing for two years and now I'm gonna say something because this is not right. So I hope that that we'll see, um, you know, just a lot more people speaking up and, and supporting those who do the right thing. So it could be a time for, for reset and uh, yeah. fresh starts all across the board uh, in practice, in uh, production and everything. Um, it's time to, to take a different view. I think too, it's, it's really the, the creativity and the innovation, the collaboration. We've had to really think of different ways to do that. And we've also had to figure out um, from a, like the consumer standpoint, which right now for most of us is through a computer screen or a TV and that whole different approach to theater all of a sudden it's, it's not you and the live audience, it's you and everything out there. And so there, there's a lot of potential and opportunities and uh, that, you know, we can sit here and, and talk across states and across, you know, timelines right now or time zones right now, which is really cool um, that we weren't doing as much of before. We were much more centralized in our community that we were a part of at that time. But um, yeah, it's, it's been very interesting on, on the, just today I'm setting up video for our musical coming in and it's like, we're having to light for video now, um, which is a whole different thing. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> We've also uh, expanded how much theater can go across the socioeconomic group because things like 
we're streaming shows that once upon a time could only be seen on Broadway and people who couldn't afford to go to Broadway would potentially never have seen. And now they're streaming or they're on public access television or they're on all these places. So you get to like, you know, present and share this experience with so many more different kinds of people. And they, they get to be introduced to our world and be like, wow, I didn't even know that was a thing. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, I was going. I was going. I agree with you. I was thinking when uh, you answered the question the first time. You, how about uh, demand or want for uh, this entertainment? That you know, we've all been. We couldn't go to concerts. We couldn't go do this. We couldn't go to the theater. I used to have uh, season tickets to the Blumenthal in uh, the Broadway Lights uh, series in Charlotte every year for uh, eight years or so. And um, I haven't been able to see a show in a while. And um, now that we are seeing things, like you said, come on public television and pay-per-view even and, and streaming services, um, not only am I getting to get getting some of the stuff that I'm missing, but it's also... Uh, enabling new audiences to be able to get this material. And so it's feeding a whole different kind of uh, uh, viewer. Yep. So that, I think that's a good thing. Alex, we yeah, had a right. question come through. I'm sorry, whoever I cut off. Are, were there any challenges in the stage managing that you didn't expect? Who wants to take that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Pete, you want to go for it? Go, go, Brianna. Go, Brianna. Yeah. So just the, the, the first thing that popped to mind was, um, yeah, again, one of, the, one of the very first shows I did, one of those sort of hole, hole in the wall things, um, I was working with film actors who uh, didn't understand a lot of the parlance of, of theater. So I would say, for example, places, please. And they would be like, what's places? <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, and, and, uh, and there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's been times, there's been times beyond that where I've, where I've worked with like non-professionals, um, in, in theater where, yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's just a constant reminder not to take anything f for granted that people will know all the intricacies of, or, or all the culture, what, what you're talking about. Sometimes you do have to, to guide people. They're not, they're not stupid. Um, uh, people just need help sometimes. KB? Um, I, the first thing that came to mind for me is like the degree to which the stage manager can sometimes have to be everyone's therapist, which is definitely <laughs> not part of our jobs. But like, I mean, there have been times if something happens while you're doing a show, like people go through serious things. They have a, you know, a parent who's dying while they're, you know, rehearsing a musical number or something and they're waiting for that phone call or they're, you know, people having, you know, personal issues of various kinds. And and it does become part of of your nurturing of the show as a whole of you know that human element of of being compassionate and being just knowing what you have to do to to serve your show and get you know get the person on stage or get them you know doing whatever they need to do but also you know being as as making as much room for for um, you know what people need on a on a personal level, or just you know it could be simpler things like just knowing somebody's having a you know a bad time and trying to you know cut them a break on something or you know, but looking out for all those sort of little personal things that really aren't like part of the job, but absolutely become part of what the stage manager has to worry about. Molly. Yeah, so I almost think both of those ladies nailed it in that we might almost be mistitled and we should be called people managers and not stage managers. Um, <laughs> in that, <laughs> this question I could sit here and tell horror stories about if we had more time. Um, but, you know, you never think you are going to know everything you're going to get into as a stage manager. And never put it past an, an actor or a technician or an audience member or anyone that they're going to always know. So there's never too much explanation you can give. Um, be prepared that somebody is going to not show is going to show up without something that you think is is necessary, vital, important. 
Um, and be prepared for having to have hard conversations. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I've had actors roll up I'm super hungover. I've had actors roll in still intoxicated. I've had, you know, lots of really negative situations. And it really is just all about your people management. Um, and I just... I was not prepared, especially as a young stage manager, that that was going to be something I encountered. And now I believe that anything can happen in any given moment, and I just need to be ready for it. Excellent. I think we have another question coming in. Yeah. Is it difficult to get a job as a stage manager? What does it take to get into the industry professionally? So, KP, let's go with you first. Um, I would say, I, I mean, I would say yes, it is. It's just, it's one of those things. It's not as hard as as breaking in as an actor in terms of the amount of people you're fighting against. But, uh, but it's the same sort of thing of like, we do a thing that is so much fun that people would do it for free if they could. You know, like it is, it's, it's a job where you have to, you know, you want to get a, a real job that pays you a living wage, but it also is something that is very rewarding. And so a lot of people want to do it. Um, I, it, the thing that makes it difficult as opposed to say acting is that you, it's all about who, you know, it's, you can get a job on a resume, but you're really just kind of, you know, shooting things out into the world blind. If you're doing that, you might get lucky and, and hit a theater or, or show that for some reason doesn't have someone, but, um, but it really becomes about your relationships with people and making a good impression and, and you can make a good impression on a hundred people, but if those people don't have jobs to hand out and you're not the, you, the thing that's tricky is you can meet like a Broadway PSM or something and be like, that person knows me. They know who I am. They like my work. They, you know, they have a good impression of me, but you have to be in the top two people in the whole wide world that they would hire before you can get a job out of that. So it's really about, um, you know, networking. I always recommend networking with the people at or just above your own level, because those are the people who will be turning down the jobs that you're actually qualified for. And what generally happens is, you know, I may turn something down and, and you know, somebody says to you know, the producer, they don't want to have to go searching because it's scary to hire someone that they don't know, because if you pick the wrong stage manager, you can really screw yourself up. So they say to me, oh, you can't do it. Oh, God, who should I hire? And then I go, well, my friend so-and-so, and that's how it usually works, is it, it's, it's mostly personal recommendations. And so it's hard to break into that, that um, scene at first. Definitely. Yeah, Karen's, Karen's hitting the nail on the head as far as the networking aspect. Uh, and anyone who says that getting a job in, in theater is not like at least 50% who you know, or, or, or luck or some combination thereof, they're lying. Um, uh, so with, with that in mind, what to answer, what does it take? A lot of it does just take uh, getting to know people, uh, seeing theater, being seen, seeing theater, um, maintaining good relationships with the people that you do come into contact with. Um, yeah, I would say that. I would say that is a big component of, of finding work is meeting people, staying in touch with those people making a good impression on those people. Molly. Um, so three suggestions just to follow up on what both of them, our previous speakers have said, and I, I agree completely. Go to conferences and network. Don't just go to, you know, workshops and stuff and then go back to your bedroom. Go hang out at the bar if you were old enough, <laughs> when you were old enough, uh, and talk to people. It's exactly what they said. Um, you never know who that person beside you is going to be just, you know, having a beer. Um, also, do things like join groups, you know, network on your social media, that kind of thing. Um if you have the opportunity to work on a production, not necessarily in a stage management role, take it anyways. If you have another skill set, if you are a technician of another kind, do it. And make it known that you are a stage manager. Because you never know when that stage manager is, as we all joke, is going to get hit by a bus. And they're going to need somebody to take over last minute. And you are standing right there. You are available. And that's your end. You just never know when something like that is going to happen. 
Um, and yes, absolutely. Just never, ever, ever burn bridges. That's the biggest thing I can say. Always give it 110%. Don't ever leave, you know, any bad taste in anybody's mouth because you're never going to know who they worked with or who they're going to work with. Um, and your name and your image in this industry is everything, guys. It really is. Definitely. <clears throat> well, I think we are going to take another question um, with Eric uh, kicking yep. off. You're stage managing a show. What is like a tool or maybe a couple of tools, something that you absolutely have to have with you when you're stage managing? Uh, <laughs> um, for me, it's uh, I have to have a good eraser. <laughs> I have to have a good block eraser. I can't deal with the pencil erasers and the pencil top. Um, it seems like a silly thing, but I, I there is a little bit of a safety blanket in my uh, nice white Sadler eraser. Um, you know, a, a good straight edge. Uh, you got to have a good notebook. You got to have some dividers. Um, you got to have a good a, a good pencil. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think as a stage manager, too, you know, this, is, this may sound a little silly, but um, I, I do carry a multi-tool with me, you know, if we're talking about physical tools. Um, I think um, one, of the, one of the moments in my career early on at uh, the North Carolina Shakespeare Festival where I had a, a situation that I was like, this is why I do this. We were doing a run through, uh, a designer run, actually, and we had uh, put together... Um, let's just call it four little pieces of furniture we had put together to make a larger piece of furniture and we had a little ratchet strap and uh for whatever reason this ratchet strap got caught and i could not get it disconnected and what the entire room is waiting on the next scene change and instead of stopping the room and com completing the momentum you know i was able to pull that out cut that strap um, in the moment you know the decision was do i stop the room and stop the process or do I take the chance that we can replace this ratchet strap and, and you know, move forward? Ultimately ended up being the right decision. Um, everybody was grateful that I had that. And I was certainly grateful that I had the tool with me uh, really just to pop off and do it. So I, I tend to rely, I, I tend to keep that with me. I think it's a good, good thing to have. I hope that answers your question. Okay. I don't know if you were talking about physical tools or actual, you know, you've, you've got that sort of stage management kit world, which, you know, early in my journey, I had the full on like, you know, trunk with all the supplies and the, you know, that was because when I was doing, you know, smaller projects, you go to these theaters as you're starting out and they don't have anything. You know, I remember when I got to the Dallas Theater Center, I spent uh, seven years as a resident PSM there. I remember when I got there and they, they showed me to the office in the supply room and I had my little, I had my little roll along box and I was like, well, guess that'll be the only day I need that because it was such a unique, you know, I, I just had taken, I had taken it, I had made a big assumption that, you know, I was going to need that wherever I went. And uh, in the regional theater, they, you don't need all that stuff necessarily. Um, now, talk about commercial theater, you know, Liz, you probably know, um, I think I've told you, you know, the thing about commercial theater that's very interesting as a stage manager is you walk into a bare space you have to think about things that you would never think about in a regional theater or when you're working inside of a building. And that, by that, I mean, it comes with tables, it comes with chairs, it comes with, you know, a basic understanding of heat and air conditioning. Like when you, when you work in New York in a commercial world, you don't, you have to think of all that. You have to rent music stands, you have to rent chairs, you have to rent tables. And every time you're doing it, you're spending someone's money. So you really, you really start to think about what do you really need? Um, you know, you read all the books and you educate yourself and all those things are good. But when you start to really look at what do you need to stage manage and, and have a good process, that list will start to get a little smaller as you go through your journey. So, KP, do you carry around a, a trunk like Carrot Head does <laughs> and or Carrot Top does and, and whip out tools here and left and right? And I don't know that it necessarily means all just tools like physical tools, but your 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 assets and stuff too. I try mentally like that's who I am as a person. Is I I want if I don't have a thing that can solve the problem in my kit, like I failed. No matter what, even if it has it's a situation that has like nothing to do with what you would ever expect in theater. 
but I have always lived in a fourth or fifth floor walk up and I have to take the train. And, and I came, like Eric said, from the world of, you know, very small venues where they give you nothing. It's like, you're getting paid a hundred dollars total to do the show for six weeks. And we're not gonna provide you with a pencil, much less anything else you have to bring it all. And um, so coming from that world, even when I work now in, in, you know, for companies that provide you with like the basics of what you absolutely need to put on a show, um, I do carry a kit that's like kind of a little, like like larger than a briefcase, like a, like a tackle box kind of size. Um, and what I focus on putting in that kit is the things that don't come with your kit from the theater or from what the producer will pay for. Um, so there's no tape, there's, no, there's like little tape, there's like mic tape, because like stage managers don't need mic tape. Yeah, you do, you're going to, <laughs> and that's the problem. <laughs> or, or, you know, just random stuff, like weird Velcro-y things that like don't even have like a real, they're like mountain climbing things or whatever I saw once in like, you know, Paragon Sports 20 years ago and I bought one because every now and then you're like rigging something in rehearsal and you're like, oh, I've got a thing in my kit that's perfect for that. I need and, a carabiner. Where's my yeah, carabiner? Exactly. Oh my God. I, I carry <laughs> probably five or six at least at a time in my kit of different sizes. And there, yeah. there have been so many shows where every single one of my carabiners has been in the show. And then I have to like have a list somewhere when the show closes of like that one and that one and that one are mine. Um, yeah. So I like to be prepared for that and, uh, you know, have, have those kind of things in my kit. And also Ticonderoga pencils are my, my big thing when you know the producer is like we're restocking the kit I'm, I, i'll bring my own at this point if they buy those cheap staples pencils that break every five seconds you gotta have, you the, gotta have the good ones yeah so brianna what was in your uh, sm kit uh you know i made i made one of those um you know like karen was talking about like the tackle boxes i made like one in college i don't think i ever used it after college um yeah because like uh like like she and eric were mentioning pretty much after i graduated i moved into venues that had those items for me so um i i downsized and uh what it, the only things that i that i really I, I kept a very small pouch on my person for the last few years i was stage managing like just yeah just small pouch it had inside it a little knife, um, pen, pencil, Sharpie, I, ibuprofen, cough drops, eye drops, Tums. I think those were the yeah. main things in it. Yeah. Um, those are important tools for sure. Yeah. So that so that was just something that I like had attached to my hip wherever I walked so that I could just easily pull it out if anybody, if anybody needed something. Molly, what's your kit? So same, right out of college, there was this rolling tool case that had everything. Um, and I will say it still comes out when I do things like festival work where there is nothing and you're working in that venue like KP is talking about where I'm walking into a hotel ballroom and we are, or Eric was talking about, whomever said it before me, we're walking into a hotel, a hotel ballroom and we're building a theater out of it. Um, and there's nothing there, so I need that fullness. Um, and uh, when I work a show now, I do, I have the standard tackle box, but the very first thing that came to my mind when we asked this question was, I have a flashlight with a blue gel in it, because inevitably, somebody backstage is not gonna have their flashlight, or not be able to see, or somehow there's not going to have been a clip light somewhere there needs to be, or whatever. And uh, if you don't have that flashlight, you're going to need it. And I always have band-aids on me because I don't know how, but actors are very accident prone. If you <laughs> miss a single nail sticking out on something, they will find it and there will be blood everywhere. And while most places are very, very good about having first aid kits, I just, I need to be prepared. I'm a Girl Scout at heart, and I, I got to be prepared. <laughs> it probably comes really in handy as a stage manager. <laughs> it does, in fact. <laughs> Do awesome. we have any uh, other audience questions? Uh, we did have one, yeah. How has the pandemic, from Lucy, how has the pandemic affected the way you work as a stage manager? Have any of you guys done any production since we've been in this COVID world? No. Yeah, okay. I mean, the answer is honestly that we're not 
working as stage managers, or at least I'm not working as a stage manager. Um, I currently have been continuing working as a house manager, and I can tell you, Miss Lucy, that it uh, it involves a lot more cleaning procedures. It involves <laughs> a lot more um, directing of traffic and where audience members can go in and out. And I imagine it would be the same thing in rehearsal spaces. It involves a lot more um, uh, knowing how far people can sit from each other and those kinds of things. So it it adds a lot of factors right now. So I'm going to call her out real quick because Lucy is our stage manager at Reynolds going into our musical next week. And so I imagine there's a lot um, of questions we all have. Um, Eric Tysinger is in the middle of a production right now. And, uh, and of course they're taking all the precautions and stuff. And it's a lot, I will say uh, as a production manager working with the crew and everything, there's a lot we have to think about above and beyond what you already have to think about. And it's pretty overwhelming actually, if you ask me, <laughs> um, but we are trying to keep everybody safe and do all the things. And you just have to think about things. You just, they're not, they're not second nature to us because we haven't rehearsed for this. Right. Um, so I do think there is a lot, um, additional layers now but i also think that technicians and stage managers and people that are used to working in the production world are probably some of the best qualified and prepared people to do it because we are used to having to roll with the punches and you know shoot from the hip figure out figure things out on the fly and i i really do believe that if anybody can do this and do it safely it's it's theater it's production it's that's why it's like we just want to do some shows <laughs> yeah absolutely any Sorry. any other audience questions um nope i don't believe so um so how are we on time we are getting close to the end of the time um uh i would like for us to wrap with um some last sort of advice for high schoolers and college students, um, people maybe that are trans transitioning into the field of stage management or thinking about going into stage management, just sort of some of that um, advice. Um, we do have a clip from Eric, but I think we can end with his clip if we wanna start with our, our live panel. Yeah, let's start with Brianna. So the, 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 the question about tools, um, yeah, I, I answered straightforward, but but what I actually had in mind, what is my best tool as a stage manager? Me, me being there, me being present, me listening, me responding, me being empathetic, me not making excuses, me just like being in the moment, recognizing that I'm working with people, I'm there to help people, um, and and I just and I just get the job the job done. I, I think that's my best tool as a stage manager is just my presence, my very obviously caring presence. I, th I think for me, the best, what I enjoy most about being a stage manager is getting to care for people and is letting people feel like they can trust me that, that I know what I'm doing and that I'm looking out for them. So is that uh, advice that you're giving as well to upcoming high school, college, or young professionals entering the uh, uh, the field is to be your best yeah. asset, your best tool, and I, I use would, your skills for the best? Yeah, I would say that. I know there's like a lot of temptations to get fancy with your SM toolkits or, or have the best paperwork or, or whatever, but I think the prim your primary focus really should be on being your best person, being empathetic, being prompt, and listening to other people and responding in the most helpful way that you can. Thank you. Molly, how about you? So my advice would be that it, when going into school and post-school, don't ever let anyone tell you that your, th your theater degree is not worth it that it is not a valid degree, that it doesn't have merit, any of those kinds of things. You have worked very hard for four years or more to build a super impressive set of skills that can not only be amazing to you in the stage management world, but can do other things for you. So even if you aren't able to find work in stage management, which I'm sure all of you will, 
there are other things that you can do with it. You have skills that are wonderful in things like event management or event planning, wedding management, all of this wide variety of a huge resume. So understand that you're not just learning how to manage a stage, you're learning how to manage people and you're learning this vast skill set that is going to be great on your resume. Very good. Excellent. KP. Um, one of the things I already said was the, the networking with people around your same level is the number one piece of advice I always give because people I think get blinded by, I've met this person who works on Broadway or whatever. And like, that's going to be my connection. It, every single break I've ever gotten in the business, except Saigon kind of came, which obviously you saw how that went. So don't count that one. <laughs> every single break I've gotten in the business, um, was from somebody that I didn't think was a connection. It was like, you know, the press rep on some off-Broadway show I did or a costume designer I'd worked with on tiny little shows or um, a venue manager at a show, I, a place I did a showcase at who got me my equity card, who just remembered my name when like three people, you know, this person called that person called this person looking for a stage manager and that's how I got my equity card from someone I didn't even think knew my name. And so you never know, like just be be your best to everyone and and I think Molly said give 110% and that's the other thing too that I wish I had known more when I was 22 is like do not ever like phone it in because you can't because there's too many other people who are trying to break in at the same time and there are only so many paying jobs and you know it you will be given really kind of crappy assignments when you first start out. You'll be asked to do stupid stuff that's not your job. You'll be taking the trash out after rehearsal or whatever. Like you're you're gonna be given stuff that you're like, oh, this is awful. This is not what I signed up for. And you're gonna be, you know, you'll be mopping the floor, you'll be making the coffee, but like do not phone it in because those are the things, unfortunately, that like you have to be the best, most conscientious, most easy to work with person that that person has ever met in order to get the next job where it'll be a little bit less crappy and you know you still have to give 110 percent there because you got to beat all the people at that level to get to the next level so um you know just don't don't procrastinate that's the one thing it, it's hard for me because i'm freelancing now I'm, I'm doing video editing and it's it's hard for me as a freelancer because my my method as a stage manager once i figured it out at like i don't know 25 is like i never put something off if something isn't done i don't stop until it's done and so it's hard for me as a freelancer to be like when do i stop when i have no schedule and like you know i've got three videos that are due and you know whenever it doesn't matter but like i can't relax if they're not done um right. because if you put it off at least the way my brain works if you put it off stuff piles up that you know the director calls you and goes hey what about that thing and they like you know they asked you to do it five hours ago and it's like you haven't gotten to it yet. And it's, you know, and then they put something else on your plate and it's like, just get everything done, clear your plate all the time because someone will call you out on it and you won't have it done yet. And you'll just be sad and it'll make your life miserable and their life miserable and make you look bad. So um, just keep that work ethic like 150%. Awesome. Um, this let's, is all really good advice. From, yeah, let's hear from Eric. So here's the way I tackle this question a lot. Um, I, I start with um, reminding us all that our network is probably our biggest asset. Um, this is a business that is um, really small in the grand scheme of things. That, that everyone knows everyone. And if they don't know directly, it's only one or two degrees of separation. Um, that was explained to me early in my journey. And I find it true. Uh, even as as recent as a week ago, pre uh, ice snow shut Texas down, I was in a conversation. Somebody said a name, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I, I did this blah 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 with them." And it is an instant credibility. And and what I mean by that is the minute you can connect with someone about another person it immediately puts someone at ease or places you in a certain uh, a way in someone's brain because they know that. And, and again, they, they, I mean, they could be dead wrong about it, but the assumption they're going to make is I know Liz May and I know her work is fantastic and I like Liz. And so if Eric knows Liz or has done something with Liz, 
there is a certain set of assumptions that are going to be made about you and the company you have kept. And it, it's, it's, it's just, I, I, I wish sometimes it wasn't that way. I wish that it was all experience and merit based the way people sort of, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, judge you or make a, you know, a decision about you or a hiring process, but inevitably that network is massive. So how do we, how do we stay on top of that? As a young person, as a high school student or a young college student, what you need to recognize is there is no experience that is necessarily a bad experience. Because even if you get into a situation and you learn some bad habits, you can unlearn those, you can relearn new habits. But what you cannot do is replace the people you're going to meet. Because inevitably on any of those shows, there's somebody that is either on their way to something great or they are, you know, you might meet someone who's um, a true big name in some industry that you happen to be meeting on a gig because they're just like you. They're in a pandemic and they're trying to find work or they're in between jobs. So they came and helped, you know, they came and helped Liz out. And so they're on this gig with you and meeting them and shaking their hand is, you can't replace that. So I, you know, I tell young people, get out there and do stuff. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Uh, you're going to have to take some not prestigious stuff. You're going to have to take some not glamorous gigs early in your journey. Um, and you're going to think this is not worth it or I'm wasting my time. But if it is you doing something with another set of people in this industry, it's not a waste of your time, not in any way. Uh, it may not pay off immediately, but it will come back to you. Um, the other thing I would say for young high school students and certainly uh, most college students, do not waste your summers, right? It is 100% necessary for you to use your summers to build that network at the highest level you can pursue. Um, and that means if I'm a stage manager, I'm out there looking at the summer programs at Williamstown, at Santa Fe, at Glimmerglass, at, you know, there's, there's a hundred of them. I will, those I just know because of uh, personal connection, but um, you got to go out and get those jobs. That's the job. Those are the ways you want to spend your summer. They're competitive jobs because everybody's trying to do that. Um, but go chase them. Don't sell yourself short. Don't think I've got to stay here and work at my, you know, local community theater if, if you don't have to. And listen, here's the great news about it. If you shoot for Williamstown and you end up at Community Theater of Greensboro, you're not going to be in a bad place. You're still going to have an experience. That is way better than going, hey, I got to take all this summer to work. I get it. You got to make money. That's no problem. But you need to figure out a way to double duty that and get your experience in the entertainment. Get yourself around the equipment. Get yourself around the people. Get yourself around the process. Because all every process you do, you're going to learn, oh, I, that is something that is something I, I did poorly. I'm going to do better next time. Or I made this path choice this time and it turned out to be a disaster. I'm going to make a different one next time. Or, oh, I, I made a surprising decision that I thought was going to be bad and it absolutely my instinct was right. All those things to contribute um, to experience building. Now, if you are um, the, the, if you're a professional looking to change careers or move into stage management or a entertainment position, I think it's important that you heed some of that advice. It's a little harder because your time management and your responsibilities as an adult become greater, right? You have different bills to pay, families to take care of. Um, there's just a, a, it's a harder process in building that network. Um, but to my, to my brain and to my experience, it does, the, the task doesn't change. Um, you have to get yourself doing it. And that is, that is one of the hardest things I see uh, for folks who are further along in their journey trying to break in is that they have a hard time going back to those early years where you're still on your parents' insurance and your mom and dad are happy to see you, you know, doing something you're passionate about. Um, when you're a little bit older, it's only you. So you have to figure out how do I survive while I chase this thing? Um, and, you know, listen, the, the harsh reality of our business, guys, is that you just don't usually walk right into a job. It's, you know, I, I tell a lot of folks often that it's, it's, a, it's a, an apprentice type industry. It's like a blacksmith. You don't just walk out as a, a person and go, I'm going to be a blacksmith. You, you have to go find someone who's a really good blacksmith. And you got to work at the blacksmith shop for a little while to learn the tools, learn what to do, what not to do. 
You can't, you can YouTube how to build a horseshoe, but I guarantee you until you've actually gone out there and screwed it up a few times, uh, you're not going to have a huge amount of success. Awesome. Well, um, is there any more, are we taking any more uh, viewer questions? You're muted, Liz. I'm sorry. I, that was my epic Zoom fail right there. <laughs> um, no, StreamYard. No. Yeah, yeah, StreamYard. Um, no, we are we are wrapping up at this point. Um, we want to encourage you guys, if you are interested in working with any of these stage managers in a masterclass or in a workshop setting, um, uh, you know, if you want to know more about what they do, uh, please, please, please go to our website at traincycle.org. And if you go to our uh, meet the trainers or slash trainers, as you see up on the screen, that will take you to all of these wonderful people's um, bios and you can get to know them a little more and uh, coordinate working with them. And we want to thank everybody for joining right. us. And we also want to thank Brianna Valdere. We want to thank Eric Tysinger, Karen Parlato and uh, Molly Miller for being awesome trainers that took your time to, uh, talk with us and our viewers, uh, potential students or uh, trainees, if you will, uh, yeah. of Train Cycle. Um, yeah, I, I, it's been awesome. I appreciate all of you being here. And Liz, thank you for letting me run my mouth because, you know, I do that anytime you ask me to. Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> anytime I can so, see that beard, Tim, anytime. <laughs> yeah, yes, but I, I never shy away from showing off the beard. Um, if to find more about me, the less desirables.com or the man who ate the town.com, uh, that's the two big ones you can find me at. So I appreciate it. If and Tim you... is also one of our trainers, by the way. Oh yes. I, I am a <laughs> podcast, uh, producer, so I will be training people how to produce podcasts. Yep. So well, thank you guys again and have a great night.